So now I think people would say, well, okay, maybe I believe this wild story about the Big Bang, but how did we get here? Uh, there are no people in the Big Bang. There's no even uh, chemical elements. So what happened? Uh, well, the story that we have is that some parts of the universe have to have been a little more dense than average so that the gravitational force acting on more condensed regions will stop the expansion, turn it around, enable a cloud of gaseous material to come back together and form a galaxy. So that's prediction number one, uh, that there has to be this. Um, and, uh, and it's okay if this, if this works. Gravitational force is actually able to stop an expanding gas cloud and make a galaxy stars in it. Um, <clears throat> then after the star is formed, then of course it can burn nuclear fuel, produce the chemical elements we described, and then uh, propel and support life here on Earth. So this is, by the way, an example of how the universe does not uh, always behave like you think. Um, everybody knows that entropy increases, that order, dis order, in decre that order uh, goes away, that uh, the universe spontaneously will get uniform. This is not quite right. The reason is gravitation. Gravitation does not quite work that way. Uh, so that's a long story. But just wanted to say that it's because gravitation attracts everything to everything that the, it's unstable and it wants to form structures. So here's a short version of the history of the universe. Uh, we've got a picture of the inside of the Big Bang. As seen from here, uh, we have an idea that galaxies form from glass clouds merging together, uh, pulling on each other with gravitational force, uh, and that from within that, <laughs> galaxies are formed. Anyway, this is our nearest neighbor galaxy. It's called M31. It's in Andromeda. It has two little satellite galaxies here and here that are in the process of being swallowed up. They will fall in in a little while. So now the text that gets people's attention. Um, a few years back, uh, Sky and Telescope magazine said they wanted a competition to rename the Big Bang because they didn't like that name. Um, and so uh, after the end, uh, nobody was chosen to have a better name. But this was one of the uh, names that was produced by uh, in, uh, published in the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon strip. <laughs> And I've actually been given the original copy of the cartoon, signed by the author. So um, anyway, the horrendous space kablooey. And uh, one of the important reasons for calling something like that instead of Big Bang is it doesn't imply to so many people that there's a firecracker going off. This suggests maybe we should think about all of space as actually expanding. Well, we don't know what space is, so how can it expand? But at any rate, it's, uh, it's different words, and it makes people feel and think differently. So you wouldn't, if you heard horrendous space kablooey, you wouldn't necessarily say, where was it? <laughs> so at any rate, uh, it produced whatever the initial conditions are, including all the dots on this map, the antimatter, dark matter, dark energy, all the things that we now claim to know. And we now even have a quite precise measurement. It's 13.75 billion years ago. So in the first moments, then the antimatter was annihilated. A tiny bit of matter was left over, um, and that's us. The helium nuclei were formed by neutrons hitting protons, and that took about three minutes. Um, and the universe was very hot then. Then the, expand, the universe continued to expand. The gaseous material cooled down and got to a low enough temperature that the electrons could find the atomic nuclei. This is a very important moment for us because a, uh, the loose electrons will actually bounce off of uh, light waves, and a light wave cannot go very far in the early universe. It'll stop and bounce. So the un early universe is opaque. After the electrons latch onto the nuclei, then it's more like air. And air is transparent. And so the heat radiation from that moment actually flies almost unimpeded from that moment until now. And so we see the universe as it was when it suddenly became neutral gas. And the temperature was about 3,000 degrees. But the age was only a little under 400,000 years. The universe is very young at that point. Then we speculate, now this is something we don't know yet, that some early generation of massive stars uh, were, occurred shortly later, a couple of hundred million years later. This is a thing to be found out, whether it's true or not. Galaxies continued to form. And then, uh, curiously enough, about five billion years ago, and we're pretty sure of this now, the universe began to accelerate. So now it turns out maybe Einstein wasn't so wrong after all. 
because the acceleration force that we're now seeing is behaving just like the constant that he added to his equations to, uh, to make the universe what he thought stable. So the anti-gravity that he put in may still be real, just uh, acting differently than what he thought. So that's poss part of our possible story. Now I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Earth because it's very interesting and it's sort of personal to us. Um, so um, how did, and this is not my personal area of research, but I just think it's really cool. So we do know that the Sun and the Earth and the first solid bodies of the solar system formed 4.567 billion years ago. How would you get such a precise answer? It's from radioisotopes. Uh, and uh, the method for doing that's not so complicated as all that, but of course requires pretty careful measurement. Then, um, okay, well, what formed in the early times, we not 100% sure, but the planets and the small bodies, uh, and apparently uh, sometime maybe uh, tens or hundred million years of, after the formation, this uh, hypothetical object, which they've been calling Thea, um, about the size of Mars, came crashing into Earth. And this uh, collision would have been enough to produce the moon. And so that's a story of how the early Earth and moon could be formed. Now, we're unique in the early inner solar system. We're the only planet with a whopping big moon like this. And so it probably is essential for our history that it's there. Um, no, no Thea, no, no life. That could be. Uh, but it was another catastrophe, I'm sure, if, if anybody had been watching. Um, so we don't really know what the early Earth was like, uh, but we do know um, that uh, f from the records of craters on the Moon and on Mars that the early solar system had a big event. Uh, several hundred million years after this uh, f event, uh, after the formation, and rocks came flying every place. And we call it, the geologists call it the Hadean uh, geological period because it was pretty nasty um, from the perspective of living things, if there had been any. Uh, when that was all over, uh, then life appears to have formed about 3.8 billion years ago as we see some, from some fossils. Now, this is not 100% sure, uh, but I, I think it's possible. I, my personal guess would be as soon as the conditions can occur, there will be some form of life. Uh, at the, if the temperature and, and water are there, you could have life. And then... Uh, and how we got here from there is a harder problem. Uh, now, uh, suppose we think about, uh, well, I want to show you this event. Um, this is a simulation of the early solar system. What we have in the middle are the orbits of the four giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And out here are the little green rocks. These are leftovers from the initial formation. And what is simulated in this calculation is that the orbits of the planets can become unstable and actually uh, change rather dramatically. So you'll see it slow down here and uh, orbits will switch around. And suddenly you'll see the little green rocks go flying every which way. <laughs> and so this is the possible thing that might have suddenly dumped a lot of rocks on Earth. Comets, asteroids, who knows what. Uh, may have brought the water that we currently have on the surface, uh, might have fallen on the Earth at that time. So this is guessing, but it's a plausible guess. Uh, I guess everybody also knows that the continents float around and move on the surface of the Earth, and we seem to be the only ones in the solar system that have this kind of arrangement. Um, and people worry a lot about uh, climate change, as we should, um, but on the, on the uh, geological time frame, we've had climate change a lot. Uh, just takes a long time. We've had volcanic activity, uh, poison gases coming out into the, sol into the atmosphere. We had several versions of giant continents, supercontinents. The uh, most recent one, uh, Pangaea, broke up uh, 250 million years ago. The Atlantic Ocean began to open up about 100 million years ago. And this is an interesting story of uh, scientific sociology because the Wegener who figured this out was not accepted. He was not understood or believed. He was had his credentials in the wrong subject. He was a meteorologist, I think. At any rate, uh, eventually scientists believed him. But even Ben Franklin knew that the continents fit together if you shoved them around on the map. And my high school teacher, my grade school history teacher said, everybody can see this. Isn't it obvious? And it wasn't to us. It wasn't to the scientists. They couldn't see how it could happen. So that's just interesting. Uh, there have been a lot of ice ages also, um, not just the recent one. There have been uh, several eras. Uh, there was one here about two and a half billion years ago. The 
there was another one, the cryogenian. That sounds cold, doesn't it? Um, and there's a possibility that the entire oceans may have frozen solid to the bottom, or mostly all the way. So um, there's a lot we don't know about this, but there's evidence. Uh, then uh, a little while after that, then uh, volcanism apparently let carbon dioxide out, uh, and the Cambrian explosion of life occurred. This is when fossils, uh, trilobites, and things turned up. So then a lot more. There's another ice age after that. Then the, the warm, moist age, the coal age. Um, then there was another heat event. Uh, an awful lot of uh, life got wiped out by the temperature and uh, retreated to Antarctica, what was left. So then I guess everybody's heard of the great dinosaur extinction. And if you saw the movie Deep Impact, you think, well, could, could it happen to us? Well, not right away, probably, but we have to find out. Uh, then recently, uh, the, uh, the uh, anthropologists are telling us possibly that human beings like us actually were walking around in southern Africa 150,000 years ago when there was an ice age on. Uh, and uh, then the sea level rose and uh, the water covered up the traces. So that might have been true. At any rate, uh, lots to think about on the long term there. And in the future, uh, there's a lot we are not going to know, know about either. Um, Galileo's telescope, we celebrated his, uh, his discoveries uh, 401 years ago, uh, last year. Um, Somehow, when I go places, kids ask me about 2012, are you sure nothing's going to happen? And I say, well, no, I'm actually going to keep on working. I'm not selling my house. <laughs> not anyway. Uh, but there are some wild uh, things that may happen. Uh, pretty clear that uh, fossil fuels are finite, and so whatever happens when they're over, it's going to be different from now. Um, and so uh, scientists are having a problem getting believed. Well, Cassandra <clears throat> knew what was going to happen. Uh, Theresius knew what was going to happen, and they couldn't get anybody to believe them either. And the uh, ancient Greeks recognized the curse of uh, knowing what would happen and not getting believed. Uh, there are some wild futures. That we're quite worried about near-term heat, uh, but it's a possibility, and this is logically possible, that uh, biological activity, which makes limestone, could actually extract the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, put it back in the ground, and it would suddenly get awfully cold here. Um, then finally, the sun will get brighter. It'll get too hot for us no matter what. Uh, in about five billion years, the sun becomes a red giant about the size of the Earth's orbit. That's going to be pretty dangerous for us. Uh, and whether or not we invent space travel, it's going to be a problem. Um, then we're about halfway through the life of the sun, so at some point it goes out. The uh, long term, the universe continues to accelerate outwards. It gets emptier and emptier. Uh, a future astronomer would say, I don't know how this all got here because this is all there is. It would only be able to see the Milky Way galaxy, and uh, most of the stars would have gone out. So that would be a puzzle then.